Hello, everybody. We're going to talk about how I added some 3D-like rendering techniques for shadowing to a 2D game made in Godot 3.2. In Godot 4, probably there's no much need for, for these techniques since it already has some very interesting lighting effects for 2D built in. But anyway, this is really interesting if you're still interested in, in starting a project with Godot 3.2. And also, uh, this is interesting for people that uh, likes to know how rendering and graphics works in general. And uh, also, uh, this was made for the GLES2 renderer but it could be ported quite easily to the to this uh, ES3 renderer so let's let's move on well let's mention several things that i think that you need to know first of all the this game although being a 2d game has everything normal mapped so that means that every sprite every tile etc has uh, information per every pixel about where that pixel is pointing to. That That is the basis to create uh, 3D lighting. Also, mm, this technique, the technique we'll explain here, is quite, quite performant and also takes a very little memory. And um, it was really possible thanks to the excellent renderer architecture in Godot where, where everything is where it should be. You, once you have dug enough in it, you know which piece of code or which class or which function you need to, to touch to do what you need. My fork of Godot for this game is public on GitHub. I'll tell you later where, where you can find it. This talk will present the, the technique in a simplified fashion, so you are not bored with some of the um, maybe less interesting details. Also, please note that the real code is rather than just this technique, like an infrastructure for rendering modes and in this case, aside from shadowing, it also adds um, a, a retro mode. But in this talk, uh, in this talk, I I will omit that that uh, retro mode thing, and will will focus on the on the shadowing stuff. The technique allows to generate two different kinds of shadows. We'll call them projected shadows uh, for the time being, and also ambient occlusion like shadows. Both will be based on the same principles, but will have some difference on how you can create them. And in order for you to know what we're achieving with this, let's consider this image of the game with the shadowing like effects disabled and see how this turns out to a much interesting image with them enabled. You can you can see that um, the the characters on the ground and also the street lamp project some shadows on the uh, on the ground, and they they react nicely with with the lights. And also you can see that um, those long parts of the building and and the windows, and well and also the the main character which is on top of the brick wall. Uh, project some some soft shadows that which are what we will be calling ambient occlusion like shadows for this presentation let's see another example this is with the shadowing effects disabled and this is with them enabled you can see for instance how the um, the shadows from the platforms near the top are projected on the on the columns and also how the how this uh, circle blades also project shadows on the on the columns also the the projected shadow for for the main character over the platforms 
Well, the main concept everything will revolve around in this technique is what I'm calling AO depth, which is a value telling something like how deep into the screen is is the the element which we want to to project shadows from with because that will inform also how those shadows interact with other elements so let's consider we have a number of uh, z based layers the the first one or the the deepest one will be for everything which z below 20 you may ask why 20? Well, that's just a uh, needs of the game. We could have used any other value, just adapting the technique to, to it. And in this uh, Z layer, which would be like the, um, the biggest level of the depth hierarchy, we'll have... Uh, well, it's worth mentioning that, that these are uh, conceptual layers. Mm, we won't see them as canvas layer or anything like that in Godot. So in this layer, we'll have a background depth level, a foreground depth level, and a characters or any, any moving object that, is, that can be interacted with level and the same goes for a second layer so everything between those z values will will get their own set of background foreground and characters layer and last for items really close to the um, to the viewer so to speak for instance there are a little cases of that in the game, like. Uh, but one example is is a a fish which is, which is an enemy that jumps from from the water, and when it's uh, jumping, uh, going up in the air, it's put uh, really really close to the to the viewer in the in the Z order. And again, this Z layer contains its own set of background, foreground, and character layers. In a real image of the game, the distribution between different kinds of layers or different depths would be as follows. First, we'd have the, the background depth with everything which is back and, well, at the interaction level, there are things that they are things that you can't interact with. Next, you'd have the foreground layer, which is for stuff which is also rendered a bit differently, looking more, more solid. And finally, you'd have the characters layer. The thing is that <clears throat> the idea is that shadows from top layers project shadows over stuff at mm, deeper layers. This would be the, the deepest uh, Z layer, which is the, the main where everything, almost everything is. But in this image, we also have some element at the, at the second Z layer, which is the street lamp, because it's rendered on, on top of the, of the char characters on, and almost everything else. And it needs to, to be at a um, higher hierarchical depth level, so to speak. How's the AO depth value computed? Well, at this point, we can abstract out from, from the Z layers the, or the difference between the, the Z layers or the kinds layers because we'll be just computing some value which will reflect both, both things. This will, would be the, the values that the, that the formula with, with compute. As you can see, they are separated by 0 0.1. That's just to, to distribute the, the possible numbers between 0 and 1 between the different layers and, and still get the possibility of some, some different values in each layer because we'll 
a layer is not, or a pixel in a layer is not fully present or fully absent. It depends on, on its alpha. So we, the shadow can be as smooth as the uh, anti-aliasing, for instance, of, the, of an sprite is. The, the column at the left is the value, the, the A of depth value we must, we must use for depending on the different, well, on the kind of, of element we are dealing with. There are also two special values, no AO, which is zero. That will mean that that item won't cast any shadow whatsoever. And there's also the explicit AO, which is, well, actually any number below zero, which means something different. We'll see it later. These values are fed in the, to, the, to the engine, to the game, via some new property that has been added to, to canvas item material or shader materials, which is AO depth, as, as you could have guessed. And, and that's why we can, we can abstract out because the, from this point onwards, the, the game will take care of computing it depending on the, on the Z value. The, the game has the elements distributed in, in those Z layers, but from that point, you don't need to, to worry anymore uh, about that. It will, you just need to, to have different materials for different kinds of, of elements in the game and, and set the AO depth property depending on, on its kind, because the, the kind also informs how they are ordered in within that Z layer. You may have noticed that at the bottom of the screen we we got um, a gray box with a number of, uh, of a source code file. Throughout the rest of the presentation we'll, we'll have more like that. I, I won't be referring directly to them. They are only tips about where in the source code the, um, the feature or, or the part of the feature that is being talked about has been, has been added to. Now, since the difference in depth value between the different inner layers is 0 0.1, that value is really quite interesting for us. So we'll be giving it a name, which will be a depth step, which we'll, we will use later. Now a word about explicit AO, which is the, um, the part of the technique to, to create fake projected shadows. These are faked because instead of being generated from the shapes of the, of the real elements in producing them, they are generated from an element that is created only for that purpose. I'm referring to, to that kind of shadow. That's created by a sprite with that image and is setting an AO depth of minus one or well any any number below zero for that matter. That will inform the te the technique that it needs to treat that that sprite especially. It's not rendered, and it produces different values on the on the buffer. We'll we'll see. We'll see right now. The the thing is that that shadow is is quite flexible. It can be animated. For instance, while the main character is running, uh, it um, it gets shrunk and expanded, and and also it could be taller or, or shorter depending on on if the the hero is standing or crouching or also depending on if it's for an enemy it depends on the on the size of the enemy so it tricks the eye quite well and it's it's enough for what we want to achieve let's get into some action the first part of the technique is creating what we would be calling an ao buffer and the, the first step is to create it. Well, Godot will create 
the, the mainframe buffer for itself for the rendering with some width and some height, depending on the size of the screen or the window. But we'll need to create a number of smaller frame buffers where the, um, the AO buffer will be stored. They are also more than one because we need to, to juggle a bit between them because some of them will, will be processed and the result written in another one. The height of those buffers will be 120. That value has been found empirically, which was the one that was giving enough detail without getting too blocky. And well, its width will will depend on the as aspect ratio of the mainframe buffer. So for for the typical aspect ratio, it it's usually 200 and, and a little more. It would be RGBA, and well, as you can see, given how small they are, they they take very little memory. The second step for the creation of the AO buffer is rendering to it. The first part is some setup. The same way Godot does some setup for OpenGL when it's about to render um, a canvas, which is or an explicit canvas canvas layer or the or the implicit always there main canvas for well just uh, as a reminder in Godot canvas items are anything 2D which is sprites and well everything from deriving from Node 2D and also any any control. In this case, we we're only caring about Node 2D derivatives like sprite or or tile map. And uh, Godot has a, a main canvas shader which is used to to render every canvas item. Only that a user provided shaders are convert it to GLSL and inject it into them. So in order to do um, the special AO pass we need to do, uh, we need to, to store in the AO buffer, we'll be using that shader because that's quite useful, but we'll be adding like an special mode to it so that the, well, the, the conditional at AO pass we are setting to true, we'll, we'll switch it to, to this different rendering mode. We'll see later how stuff works while, when it's rendered that way. And also the GL uh, will be set to accumulate the RGB values, the incoming RGB values will be accumulated to, to those already in the buffer. And the alpha will be replaced. So any alpha coming in from well, from the element we're rendering, will replace the, the alpha value, which is already present in the buffer. OK, now the, um, the, the bulk of the work, so to speak, which is the rendering. This will be more or less uh, like the same thing Godot does for rendering a canvas, but um, quite simplified. The thing is, for every canvas item which belongs to, to that well to the main canvas in the game, if its AO depth is greater than zero, that means it's the, the normal AO, AO, not the not the faked projected shadow. Will be computing a contribution value, which is the well the incoming alpha from that pixel at some sprite. AO depth step times. That means that we're mm, scaling the alpha value at, uh, from instead of 0 to 1 to 0 to 0 0.1. 0 0.1 would be the, the maximum value. To the uh, red component, we'll be accumulating this contribution. And regarding the alpha, since we can't really capture in this implementation exhaustive information about every layer, we are capturing there only information from the topmost layer. This is a compromise. So since in the red we already have information 
although aggregated from every layer and in the alpha we only get information from the topmost layer we can at later steps do some inference good enough since we are we aren't actually interested on on the interaction between layers that are deep behind um, other ones which are closer to the to the viewer that's it at alpha we'll be storing the opacity at the topmost AO layer and also with an indication of which layer and for elements with a negative AO depth which are the, the sprites that create the projected shadows will be only writing to the G component accumulating their alpha value just as it is uh, uh, unscaled now Let's consider this moment in the game, this frame in the game. Let's see how the AO buffer would be generated for this one. The red component would look like this. As you can see, it's like an X-ray view of the different elements since we, we have been accumulating values here. So the, the more overlap, the, the brighter the color. Anyway, the contrast has been tweaked because otherwise since there's not a lot of overlap, the, the colors would have been really dark. Now the, the green component of the buffer is just like a downscale version of the explicit shadows generated from the specially crafted sprite we, we saw moments ago. The blue component is not uh, written to any, at all. And this is the alpha component that looks more or less like we expected. Each pixel is only affected by the topmost element. The last step to get our AO buffer is blur plus. It's called plus because it's not only blurring. Blurring is the basic thing to do since we want soft shadows and also we want to, to hide the, the blockiness that would appear from the low resolution of the buffer. But we're doing other things. We'll do this in, in two steps. The first will be the horizontal pass, in which every output pixel will be generated from the input pixel at the same coordinates, and also four of its neighbors, two at the left and two on the right. And we'll be doing some, some simple math with the color components, but I, I won't delve into much detail regarding this, but I'll give a, a number of tips. For instance, what we're getting at the R component is, is an accumulation of the, of the input alpha, which was the value from the topmost AO layer. This will help later step resolving overlapping better. At G, what we are doing is just doing a, a simple averaging blurring of the original values, which is the, the accumulated opacity. Note that uh, we are taking the, the R value, which is where we start the um, accumulated opacity, but we are writing it now to the G component. And at the, at the blue component, we are blurring the, the fake shadows. But if the fake shadow value on the pixel at the center is greater than that average, we'll keep in that instead. This helps projected shadows avoid losing too much intensity due to blurring. This formulae and uh, which to accumulate, which to average, etc. And oh, as well as the radius of the, of the filter have been found empirically by trial and error. After doing a horizontal pass, we'll do the vertical pass from the output of the, of the horizontal one. This time, the, the main pixel is the bottommost one rather than the one at the center. That means that we are blurring towards bottom, which creates the, the illusion that the light comes from the top. This matches the game quite well because the, the moon is always present at the top. It's also kind of built in most of the shaders in the game at the, the illusion of a directional light from top to down. Just briefly, well, we, we're not juggling the RGB values any, anymore. R goes to R and so on. So at R, we are 
put in again the maximum opacity of the topmost layers. So that's uh, an effort contributed by both passes. At output G, we're averaging the accumulated opacity, which is, uh, um, as a reminder, the, the values that looked like X-ray. And the output B is the average of the input B. So the idea is to, is to keep blurring this time vertically the projected shadows. But if the value from the pixel above the main pixel is higher, that, that means it's darker, we keep that instead. This is uh, to make the shadows stronger uh, near the more, more or less opaque pixels that produced them. This is how the resulting red component of the blurred placid <laughs> AO buffer looks like. As you can see, we, we have succeeded in getting the topmost value. So we have information about the, the topmost element uh, or the topmost depth value that affects every pixel, considering also its surroundings. At the green component, well, we have a blurred version of the accumulated opacities. The contrast in this image has been tweaked for the same reason as earlier. And at the blue component, we simply have the faked shadows just uh, blurred. We're going to see now a function that, that has been added to the Godot Canvas shader in a way that it's available for a user Canvas shaders, which is the one that resolves the AO value for each pixel on a sprite, tile, or whatever. This function will be sampling the AO buffer and will use the, the alpha of the current pixel of the current element as well as the AO depth value of the, of the current element. With all, all that information, it, it will be able to, to resolve overlapping and therefore shadowing. It takes the, the alpha of the current pixel as an input and then it gets some color it, R component is the maximum of the R of the four neighboring texels. Four neighboring texels because, uh, you know, when you are sampling from a texture from a UV coordinate, you are, you are targeting not just as a single texel, but also its three closest neighbors. You'll see this clearer when we talk about the green and blue components, which are a bilinear interpolated uh, value from the green and blue of, of those same texels. This is just what a standard bilinear filter does. But notice that once again, we are getting the maximum R component to keep all the time a notion of what's the topmost AO layer. Now this check means that if the depth of the current element is higher than the depth we have found in the AO buffer, that element or that pixel of the current element being rendered is not shadowed. So we are just returning, as you can see in the, in the second vector two, zero, which means no shadowing at that element. And the, the blue value of the, of the vector which is the projected shadow value that's returned straight in case the user facing shader wants to do something with it. And otherwise, this means that we are under shadow. So as the first component of the vector, we are returning the closest we can get to the amount of darkness this, this pixel is receiving. And the second element, just the same as, as before. Only just notice that we are doing that subtraction. So we, instead of returning how dark a pixel needs to be, we're returning how bright it needs to be. So the, the user facing shader at Godot just needs to multiply. And finally, this is a scaffold of a user canvas shader in Godot would look with extensions we have made to the shading language. AO enabled is needed because also the visual server API has been extended to be able to enable or disable AO effect. And text AO calls the, the GLSL function we have just seen in the previous slide. So uh, once everything is in place, using this in the game is, is rather easy. You just get that vector two containing 
uh, values for the two different kinds of shadows and then you can use it whatever you want in both the fragment and light shaders well we've walked a very long way but remember we've been able to get from this to this and from this to this you can check the actual code at my fork of Godot for hell rule at that URL. Please follow me on Twitter. I'm just trying to tweet interesting stuff. I'm trying to stay away from, from some topics I'm not on Twitter for. And also you can get hell rule on, on Google Play. It's free. It doesn't have any microtransactions or ma macro transactions. It, it doesn't have any ad as well. It's just a game you can install and play. On the future, it will get more levels and will be also released on more platforms. So, thank you very much. I hope you haven't suffered much and also that you have found this at least slightly interesting.